Hey, so Jesse, we talk a lot about college on this show. Yeah, we do. And what we actually mean is Avondale University College, where we both got our bachelor degrees in ministry and theology. Yeah. And, you know, that's also where we became buddies and we lived in the dorms. We ate at the calf, walked to class in the sunshine. It was great. It was great. We had late night Maccas runs. We led in worship and uh, we also met some of our closest friends there. Absolutely. Probably one too many late night Maccas runs for me. But, you know, honestly, studying at Avondale was the best. And we're so stoked to say that this episode is sponsored by Avondale University College. Called to make a difference. Called to beat Avondale. Welcome back to Burn the Haystack with Josh and Jesse. I'm Jesse. And I'm Josh. And this is a show all about saving the best and burning the rest. And today you've got the other Josh for yet another time. It's just the Josh who has hair on his face rather than hair on his head. <laughs> uh, I feel sorry for you, buddy. Um, our recent, for those of you who have uh, been tuning into our Instagram recently, you kind of lost out in the whole uh, who needs to shave their face or head sort of scenario, yeah, look, I think. I don't think I lost out. There were some votes to, to at least get a trim or a tidy up and I'm okay with that. Yeah. But the current challenges here uh, for those who are listening. I'm from Melbourne um, and we're not allowed to have barbers trim beards because we have mandatory mask wearing at the moment. So to to go out in public, we have to wear a mask and to get a beauty treatment of any sort, you have to wear a mask for the whole duration. Um, some <laughs> people really would work. say that wearing a mask is a beauty treatment for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and on that note uh, of beauty treatment, I'd like to welcome <laughs> our very, very special two guests. We have two today, two for the price of... Uh, none. None. We're not paying Because we're not people. paying you. <laughs> uh, everybody, welcome to the podcast. Emily and Linda, welcome. How are we all? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me, us. <laughs> Awesome. Now you guys, you guys are here for a very special reason. Today's episode, we're going to be looking at the US election, which in Australia, New Zealand time is today, day of recording. Yeah. But for you guys, is technically tomorrow. Um, very divisive issue as it could be, but we want to try and have a bit of a, a discussion. Look at how elections, politics, and faith kind of can work together, and how you can still be friendly towards each other even if we're on different sides of the political divide. So mm. we've got Em, uh, who you're largely uh, leaning one way. I'll let you guys describe this later. And Linda, you lean the other. But before we get into that, uh, let's just find out who you are because people may know you, Em, from a little kind of side hustle project you had a little while ago. Um, but Linda, you're probably more of the unknown. So let's start with you. Who are you? Where are you from? What are you about? Hey, so my name is Linda, and I am a former university chaplain. I was from last year university. I uh, spent 13 years there on campus working with student missions, uh, local outreach, international humanitarian aid, that type of thing. I got to know Emily when I spent a few months over at uh, the place where she works, Quiet Hour Ministries, getting to again, work with individuals internationally sharing about Jesus. And now I am the pastor for outreach, associate pastor here at the Vallejo Drive SDA Church in Glendale, California. So awesome. That's about me. Yeah. So very much ministry mindset is your kind of career, be it chaplaincy or, or church pastory type stuff. That's, that's where it is, whether it's nationally or internationally as you're sharing. Right. Take it as Definitely. it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. And what about yourself? Tell us who you are, where you're from, a little bit of your background as well. Yeah. So uh, some of you may know me from the uh, Adventist Millennial podcast, which I did for a while. And don't come in my inbox wondering where it is because we don't know if it's coming back. 
Um, you can come in my inbox and ask me. It might motivate me to start it up again. But I, uh, I'm from Texas, uh, and I have a degree in English, and I work in marketing, and I work for Quiet Hour Ministries, um, doing international evangelism type stuff. And uh, yeah, that's the need to know. So Adventist Millennial has stopped because you don't consider yourself a millennial anymore? Yeah, or an Adventist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. no, so last year, actually, I was traveling a lot for a quiet hour, like a lot. And it just got to the point where I didn't have the energy to do both. Um, because as, if you listened to that podcast at all, you know that I'm very prone to procrastinating. And so uh, <laughs> right during that period where I was just traveling so much, <clears throat> I stopped it and then it just never got jump started again. So mm. if you want it back, you just have to hassle me about it. I still I still remember you were, it was towards the end of the life of the podcast. And I remember there was like an episode. It was like a really short episode. You either recorded it really late at night or really early in the morning in some motel or something like that. And you promised there was there's going to be one last episode yeah, I know. of the podcast, and it never came. I know, I know. <laughs> and then it got to the point where it was like, well, it's already been such a long time. <laughs> is it worth me doing it? And so then at at the like one year anniversary of not having done any, I was like, I should like do that <laughs> one that I promised. And then of course, because I'm flaky, I didn't do it. <laughs> Oh. So this, this is very similar. My wife loves telenovelas. And so there's a telenovela that's a period drama called The Grand Hotel, which was remade um, as an American drama called The Grand Hotel. Um, and it ran, for, I think, for like four seasons as a telenovela. And at the end of the first season of The American, like the main character got shot. It could have been like three people. It wasn't renewed for season two. <laughs> so, so you'll never know. So I yeah, feel that just... that's my experience with the Adventist Millennial yeah, last episode. Right. It's, it's the cliffhanger angle. Who shot yeah. the final episode? Yeah. <laughs> who shot M? <laughs> it's not who shot Mr. Burns. I love it. <laughs> uh, cool. Awesome. Uh, hey, so, okay. Today is all about politics. Uh, as of the um, sort of this episode coming out, we will be in the thick of election madness um and we have asked the two of you on the podcast because you have two differing political leanings um i'm sure that there are some things that you hold in common but uh today is about exploring the i guess the two sides because that's for better or for worse what we have uh right now um M could you uh, just explain to us sort of a little bit about how you identify politically and then I'll ask Linda if she can do the same. Uh, I identify as right-leaning, conservative, maybe a little bit libertarian-leaning, although you probably won't catch me voting libertarian, but in general, my philosophy is libertarian. Okay, cool. Have you always been um, conservative-minded? Um, yes, although, uh, I was never as heavily interested in politics as I am, as I have been since like college. Okay. So I didn't really care as much when I was younger, but, but now it's a, it's a fun hobby. <laughs> That's an interesting rabbit hole that we're going to head down a little bit later <laughs> as around, you know, Americans and their care for politics. Um, mm -hmm. Linda, tell us about your political leanings. Um, so I grew up in Tennessee, so my family heritage comes more from the right Republican side of things. Um, majority of my family is a part of that party. Not that they necessarily vote down party lines, but it's, it's my upbringing. Uh, however, for myself, especially college forward i have been more of the the progressive labeling of the democrats on the left if mm. we're using those words yeah yeah so we got the the republican and the democrat we're talking u.s presidential election so we're essentially biden versus trump here um 
thankfully and we've deliberately asked you guys here on zoom so you can't punch each other um <laughs> we would have sent around boxing gloves if that was the case um but the reason i the reason i go there is because i'm reading news websites here bbc which is clearly the british not the australian but you know we have access to these things on this wonderful thing called the internet mm-hmm. um access to news media is essentially telling us regardless of the outcome of this election prepare for a level of almost a second civil war. Um, how are you guys feeling the tension in the States at the moment? I saw, for instance, I saw a picture of Macy's on Broadway boarding up their store because of the, the fear and the anxiety that, that is held in America at this point. How are you guys dealing with that? How are we dealing with it or what are we observing or both? All of the above. Mm, definitely. Um, well, I mean, I, I think this whole year has has sort of brought people's tensions very high because we've had um, lockdowns, which caused uh, a lot of anxiety and a lot of sort of cabin fever. Then you, we've been having a lot of riots throughout the summer and a lot of things happening. And it just feels like people are sort of getting whipped up into a frenzy. And it doesn't seem like, I, I think it's probably a good guess that whatever the outcome is, there will be some kind of similar drama to what's been happening all year. And I think, uh, I think most people sort of take that opinion. Yeah. I agree with M adding, adding to that. A lot of the boarding that people see, you know, news, the news can, uh, exaggerate sometimes. No. Some of the boarding is just because COVID <laughs> has happened and stores have had to close, you know, so many family owned or independent companies uh, just can't afford it. So they're trying to protect their property. But yeah, things like today or yesterday, um, they erected one of those non climbable walls, uh, fences around the White House, again, uh, in preparation for actual election day tomorrow, even though we're well into elections. I mean, mm. over 94 million Americans have already voted, which is... Which is 70% of the 2016 total voter turnout. Yeah, so it's huge. So tomorrow is is just the observed day, and obviously there are people who are going to show up. But yeah, a, a lot of the things in the news um, is, is because of, like Emily said, protests that happened during the summer, also just safety it's not all because of the yeah. elections that are it's not been a normal election year let's be honest mm, you've you know definitely. coronavirus we've had you know race issues and yeah. discussions around police brutal- brutality and defunding police and those sorts of things that have been happening as well which have probably just it's more fuel to the fire that yeah. you ordinarily wouldn't have come an election year Now, here in Australia, we have a little bit of a challenging thing where um, we have two-party, largely a majority two-party preferred kind of political system. So we've got the Labor Party, um, who are more liberal, and then we have the Liberal Party, who are more conservative, just to confuse everyone. (laughs) So... Um, uh, so thankfully you guys don't have those sorts of hoops you've got to jump through as, round, as far as understanding what your political party kind of stands for. You know, you know what's liberal and you know what's conservative. But one of the, the challenges um, that the US has as far as politics and, and election and whatnot is voter turnout. Um, we, we look at the average number of people turning out to vote and it is considerably... On, in the scheme of things, are low compared to the number of people who are eligible to vote. Um, in Australia, we have v- v- our elections are always held on a Saturday. We can do early voting and postal voting and, and that sort of thing. But we also have this thing called the democracy sausage. So there's always like a an Australian barbecue with sausages being cooked up so you can have a sausage as you go to vote. Um, but you guys vote on a Tuesday, um, which is a general work day which makes it difficult for people to go and vote. The other thing that we have that you guys don't have is mandatory voting. Um, So if we don't vote, we get like a $50 fine for not voting. Um, So one of the things that I want to ask you guys around kind of your voting history, your political history, did you vote in the 2016 election? Um, 
And what would your thoughts be on instituting a mandatory type voting system for America? I'll go. Um, can I? So, um, I heard about and tell me tell me if anyone else has heard about this. Some other some other countries have things like they've made it so easy where you could vote on your cell phone. You have to use like your equivalent of your social security number or something like that and you can you can just do it from your phone mm -hmm. and it makes it easy versus i don't know if you've seen here in the states there are some counties some some states where people are standing in line forever yeah. like seven plus hours and then some other locations where you can walk in walk out and and you're done so it it's a really odd system that we have in place right now uh, that does not necessarily favor those who want to be actively engaged in the political process, uh, in the process of having a say in what's happening in their lives. So for if we could figure out a way to make it easier versus having it be mandatory, I think the numbers would just go up if we just made it easier. So it's more about um, access rather than anything else. Right. I, I think part of it is access. Yeah. Um, and then also the issues. If, if you're talking to Gen Z or others, you know, is it relevant to my life right now? Like, is this something that I need to, to actually vote on? I think people show up when they feel like it's relevant to them in their lives. Uh, so that's a thing. Mandatory. I mean, that'd be kind of awesome to see what would happen to our, to, to our politics here if you force people to, to vote. Are they all just going to like do bubbles down the thing to be like done? I don't care, you know. <laughs> Especially like, when you got you've got states like New Hampshire, whose like state motto is "Live free or die hard," and there's like no tax in their state at all. <laughs> so it's like, you know, mandatory anything might be a little bit too far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, are you guys happy to share if you did vote? You don't have to say which way you'd vote, but obviously you've already shared which way you lean. But did you vote in the 2016 election? I did. Yeah. Yes, M? I did too. And I'll awesome. say who I voted for. It's not a it's not a surprise out of left field. I voted red all the way down the ballot. Yeah. Last time last time and this time uh also. Uh as far as mandatory voting, I think you hit the nail on the head, Josh. I don't think that will go over well in the United States. Yeah. Uh, people are just in general kind of averse to mandatory anything. Um, to Linda's point, I don't know this, but I would be interested to see um, the voting turnout in states like California with universal mail-in uh, mail voting. Because if, if the uh, idea is to just make it easier, um, you know, setting aside the whole controversy of <laughs> reliability and et cetera of mail-in voting, Simply voting in California is not that bad because you can just fill out your uh, your ballot and drop it off or mail it or whatever. So I don't know. I don't. I haven't looked up um, turnout for states like California versus other places, um, but that would be interesting. But if I'm playing the sort of stereotypical right wing archetype here, I'm gonna say, not only should we not have mandatory voting, we should increase the voting restrictions you know, maybe repeal the 19th Amendment, you know, <laughs> women's suffrage, maybe in, maybe institute some kind of property ownership uh, requirement, you know, I increasing the difficulty for the privilege to vote, I think is generally a right-wing sentiment that's embraced because the, the general attitude is people who are voting probably are not as well informed as they should be therefore is it smart for them to be voting and mm -hmm. um so maybe an iq test prior to voting <laughs> or at, or at least like in uh some kind of issues information do you yeah. actually know can what I, you're voting can i just ask did you like i know you said this this is the archetypal thing but repealing the 19th amendment as far as essentially women's right to vote um would we then also repeal the right to vote based on age? Um, what's that? That's the 26th Amendment, um, not discriminating based on age if you, you know, turn 18 just two days before and you're 
voting, you haven't registered to vote yet. Would you would we repeal that as well to make access to voting not as easy? Um, I mean, depending on who you talk to, there are different different schools of thought as far as which pieces you restrict. I think a, a lot of people on the right are in favor of, <laughs> at least at the very least tongue in cheek, some people are very much serious um, when they say repeal the 19th in the sense that if you're giving sort of each family one vote, um, then yeah. Now, Linda, you had like a visceral reaction <laughs> to the repealing of the 19th Amendment. <laughs> Do you want to share something there? No, it's just, it's, uh, it's so interesting to hear some people, like Emily said, some people actually take that seriously, uh, that, that not everyone should. And so this, this entire conversation actually about the IQ test or whatever makes me really uncomfortable because even though I know how you're saying it there are people who who actually think that um and then we get into into all of the legalities and all of the things when it comes to economics and funding of schools and who had access to go to school to get the funding to be able to be these ones that get to vote you know like everything like it 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 helps to start undo everything um that's why i was saying i think just making it easier and even here in california one of our local measures uh, is to change the voting age, not voting age, but like if you are 18 on the day of the national election, even though voter registration had ended early, you can still vote. Like those types of yeah. things are are being voted on in at least the state of California. Um, but yeah, I mean, even before COVID, uh, voting wasn't the easiest thing uh, in some states because of the number of locations that you could go to because of some of the restrictions of because of whatnot. And we, 2016, I think like 80%, between 80 and 90% of people who were registered to vote actually voted. That's of people who took the time to register mm. actually voted, um, not including everyone else, 130 million or something was it. That's all that voted during 2016. Now, just to come back to the 19th Amendment, um, the there was an article I came across, a Twitter feed I came across, where the, the blog post is titled, Husbands, Make Sure Your Wife Votes Exactly Like You. Um, and the whole notion was, if you don't, then you actually cancel each other out. Um, so why would you want to do that? But does not then there become a discussion around kind of, in some respects, if it's husbands, make sure your wife votes exactly like you, something around the the idea of, um, what's the word I'm after? Uh, abuse, like political, spiritual, psychological abuse in forcing your, your wife to vote the way you want. And does that, what, what like, what does that do for you guys as women? Um, when there's there's people saying husbands, your you must control the way your wife votes. Essentially, what's well, the issue of headship? Like that's not it's 2020. Uh, <laughs> and okay. also, we're Seventh Day Adventists, so uh, so I, I I mean just just from those two perspectives, uh, I think it it doesn't work. We okay. we each are our own person. You know, yep. we're individuals. You uh, can't vote, but you can, you know, take a nail and drive it through a, t a tent peg and drive it through the, the temple of your husband. So, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's a thing. I mean, obviously, there, there are mixed cup, uh, couples where they're constantly erasing their vote, but it's still important for them to vote uh, and for them to know that they have that the democratic right. right. Exactly. Yeah. I'm curious, now, Em, as to where you are on this sort of thing as partly a libertarian how does that sort of idea of you know big government don't step on me mesh with the conservative ideals i i know that libertarians do tend to swing a little bit more conservative than than liberal but um yeah w what's your take on that uh specifically on repealing the 19th or just the general concept of men making their wives vote the same uh, no I, th I think I think on the idea 
general idea of accessibility to to voting and stuff like that because i feel like that would be a conflicting idea of on the one hand i it's part it is part of a bigger question that i want to ask around voter suppression or at least the perception of voter suppression that we're seeing right now in different states of america but also this idea of how does libertarianism fit with what we're seeing right now in the republican party and the idea of access to voting and all that right. sort of stuff. Um, I don't think there's a huge conflict. Um, personally, I think that voting is plenty easy. If it's important to you, go and do it. Um, and usually uh, doing a bunch of things for the sake of or in the name of making it easier um, you can make the libertarian argument that that's going to cost more money. It's going to be a uh, government bungling of the system as you, as per usual, it's going to cause a bunch of other cascade of problems that are not improving uh, the overall situation for the sake of, or in the name of making voting easier. So because, because the, the libertarian sort of mindset already thinks kind of too many people are voting who shouldn't be, who don't know what they're voting about. Um, I don't think it's a, a big conflict philosophically to say, why are okay. we trying to make it easier okay. when it's not necessarily that hard? Okay, well, let's I talk about, the, sorry, you go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think the, the, the question or the comment on uneducated voters is not a distinctly US political argument. I think that's universal. Um, yeah. I know that even in the Australian context, Jesse, you're there in New Zealand and have witnessed elections there. You would be having the same discussion no matter what country we're in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, we just have this in New Zealand right now. There are a great number of Adventists and Christians that I know who are very unhappy about Jacinda Ardern coming in for a second term um, simply because they think she's ridden on the coattails of her general popularity with popular media and the rest of the world uh, and people have gone out to vote for her and her party not realizing or not really fully comprehending uh, the policies and the direction mm. that the party actually is going to make an impact on in their in the in the life of the country um, so i definitely heard that um, two weeks ago when we had our election here in New Zealand, of which was a landslide. Um, ironically, um, the Labour Party is, is, is red and the National Party is blue here, which is sort of our Conservative Party, the two-party system. So it's very confusing. When um, we, when we uh, had red going through Parliament, um, so majority of seats in Parliament are red, it was. It took me a moment of going. Hang on. Okay. This is not. This is not Republican. <laughs> this is Labor. This is a. This is a Liberal Party, not a Conservative Party. And they're yeah. So. But but your political Wait, system so in New Zealand. I have a question, Jesse. Do you vote in New Zealand? Yes. Yes. Oh. Yeah, voting is not Are mandatory. A... It's not mandatory here, um, but we do vote. Um, but, but the question I mean, you got like, ask, citizen, resident, how does that work? Is Australia, that the Australians, Australians have permanent residency in New Zealand. It's part of the, I think it's part of the Trans-Pacific um, partnership. partnership thing. Oh. So if you're an Australian, you live in New Zealand or you're a New Zealander, you live in Australia, you have full voting rights. Okay. Uh, it's a bit more complicated if you're an uh, immigrant of some other place. So, yeah. Now, the fact that you guys in New Zealand had a landslide victory is unheard of because of the, the New Zealand political system. Biggest landslide history, biggest landslide in uh, the Labor Party's history. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So um, if I can get back to, to US politics for a moment, and this, this is a little bit tongue in cheek, are these the best two candidates you could come up with? Like if I look at the, the news media, whether we're talking, you know, mainstream media or, you know, fake news media or whatever you want to label anything, your two presidential candidates have both been actively accused of sexual misconduct. And you guys essentially have the choice of this sexual deviant in the White House or this <laughs> sexual deviant in the White House. You're okay with that? Uh, if you had asked me this question in 2016, I would have said, no, this is crazy. What are we doing? I'm voting against, <laughs> like, against my better judgment for Donald Trump. If you ask me that in 2020, I would say 50% yes. Donald Trump is the best candidate we have. 
on the Republican side of the aisle. Joe Biden 100% is not the best we have to offer up on the Democrat side, in addition to the fact that he probably won't, uh, is generally assumed that he won't stay in that position, that Kamala Harris will step in fairly soon after he takes over. So first of all, she didn't win any of the primaries. Nobody liked her to begin with. So why are we just like shoehorning her in here? That's that's what I would say in 2020. Well, let's, let's just um, go back to the fact where the 12th Amendment um, allows for the current vice presidential process, whereas it was literally just used to be whoever came second was the vice president. So if we were talking uh, 1800, let's say Donald Trump wins this election, then Joe Biden would be your vice president. Mm. I find that almost comical to think that <laughs> that could happen. Um, or Joe Biden with Donald Trump as vice president. Um, I'm glad you have that amendment. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, I mean, if it, I'll, I will admit there was a part of me in 2016 that was voting for entertainment factor. And if you throw that in there, you know, yeah. big points for entertainment factor. <laughs> I think yeah. a and lot of people voted that way for that reason. In I retrospect. think some people are still voting that way because Kanye was on the ballot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. on, like, yet yeah, not in every state. One. Guys, you don't understand. So just... I, I watched the Kanye West jo, um, Joe Rogan episode. If I was in the US, I'd be totally voting Kanye right now. And so I, I would I would have voted Kanye too if I didn't think it was so important for Trump to win a I shared this with you guys before we recorded. I'll share it with those listening. When I was 21, I ran for local government against my dad. Neither of us got elected. Um, there were, I think, 11 candidates in my ward um, and we were electing three people from that. Um, I got... Um, I ranked 11 in the order of number of votes. Um, the guy who got tent so one above me he was arguing like his his little voter bio just had isbn so book identification numbers um made no yeah. sense the things that he wanted was an 888 story wall around the city just think how tall that is an 888 wall story wall around the city and a landing pad for alien spacecraft and he got more votes than i did are you sure you didn't run against donald trump <laughs> <laughs> who knows anything could have happened I was so, thinking like oh go ahead oh I was just gonna I was gonna circle back around so if you want to finish commenting on this M <laughs> no it was just a it was a throwaway joke go for it gotcha well I'm uh, I'm coming back around to are these our best candidate because M said some strong things and I just wanted to take a <laughs> you want to you want to write a reply uh I just yeah can I have my two minutes thing no I'm kidding uh so <laughs> I just, you know, when it came to the Democrats, there were what, like 30 plus people at the beginning, at the onset a year ago, when before Biden even threw his name officially into the ring, uh, there were so many people and, and it came, it came down to him. A lot of Democrats will say, uh, because they wanted to work together to get Trump out, right? Like, let's do what's best for the party. So you're putting the party first versus Should they not first. always be doing that? Party first versus person first? Mm. I think the Democrats do that a lot better than the Republicans. Um, yeah, you want, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Because here, there, you'll know, I mean, People don't always, they can register one way, but they might vote another way. And we found that happened in 2016, um, like 5% of Dems voted for Trump and vice versa for, for mm. Clinton. So it's just one of those things. Like it, sometimes it's an issue. I think that they vote for it's the issues, the platforms. I think this time around people are voting for the person. Mm. Uh, it's not necessarily the issues. So it's really or interesting. voting against the person. Or voting right. for Biden. So there, it's, I think that's a really important distinction with this election as well. Like it has been less about the issues for 
a certain party, the Republicans, whereas the Democrats, I think, still want to aim for all of the things that they stood for in 2016. And um, hold on a second. And then, uh, and then, uh, so that's why so many people that could have been great, Pete Buttigieg or, or others, Bernie, I'm a, I'm a Bernie girl, actually. Uh, so, so I think we are voting person uh, who's going to be best for the country, not just for a political party. So there was a visceral reaction when M made a comment about the 18th, uh, the 19th Amendment. Wait, 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 wait. I might but have You've got a better visceral. Or, yeah. <laughs> I might have misunderstood what you said. Did you say the Republicans are voting more on person than on policy? Or the other I way think, around? Yeah, because I don't think that your person is actually for those policies. So I think it is all about the name and the entertainment versus what he's actually doing because he's not actually fighting for any of those issues. I mean, you're not showing up for any security briefings for the last four years. So how are you saying that you are there for the government's security or safety or any of those things? It's, it's a joke, like he's not, it's for the person, not for- I would, I would say, I, w I agree with you if you're saying that Republicans aren't voting based on Democrat policies because it's not about the person at all. Uh, most Republicans that I know, especially the Christian ones, are like, heck no, we don't respect Donald Trump. We think he is, you know, a loudmouth and a brute, and we don't like the way that he talks, and we think he's kind of off-putting, and, you know, he he's all very orange. But that being said, he's one of, been one of the policy-wise and administration-wise, he's been one of the most conservative presidents in modern history, and we're willing to put the rest of the character arguments aside because he's doing the things that we want him to do. And uh, I think it I think it's only can be construed as for a person if you're looking at it through the lens of a left a left-leaning perspective of Republicans. Does that make sense? This is this is really interesting because I think that, you know, M, you're kind of saying that you're voting down party lines because you vote red. That's just who you are. Whereas, Linda, you're perhaps, if correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying this time it's really not so much about blue versus red, but <laughs> Biden versus Trump. This time it's um, personal. Yeah. And so, so is this the most personal election that we have seen in forever or is this about the parties anymore you know here in our in our news media and depending on which station uh you're listening yeah. to you're hearing things like it's it's the vote of our life it's the vote of the you know things things like that go out and vote for your life I, i've i mean i've seen that on on different propaganda that's gone out um when it comes to when it comes to the Dems, at least I think uh, the reason there it's twofold. I think because of the issues, because the issues are so important, it's important it's important to get the person into position. There was too many p words there. I realize. I That's okay. It's powerful. Um, but because of the issues are so important, we have to have someone who is going to be able to be in the White House. Policy, uh, person, position, position. president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you <laughs> Keep go. going. Um, uh, let's talk. So let's, the potential let's... for political. No, wait, 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 wait. Just to point out the height of irony in saying that we need someone that's able to be in the White House and then shoving Joe Biden up there who can't even complete a full English sentence without, you know. <laughs> Have you listened to some into... of Trump? <laughs> also, Biden has an actual stutter like he's overcoming that so that was an unfair statement for you uh, but, judging but someone who has this comes back to the, no, 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 this no, comes no. back to the question you know you've got these two guys who have got like sexual allegations against them both of them are in their 70s biden would be the oldest first term president in your history yeah. trump has Trump's campaign has come out and said that if he doesn't win this election then it is most likely that he would contest the 2024 election which would make him again the oldest president elected in your history yet he's using that argument against biden as to why you shouldn't elect him so by that 
argument, he should say, well, this is it for me, regardless of the outcome. I won't contest again. But you're talking about policies and whether they're party policies or person policies and what's best for the party and so on and so forth. What are the policies as far as what speaks to you and how does that really resonate with your expressions of faith? And this can be things around how has lack of ch live church services or the different live church services you've experienced with coronavirus affected you? Um, what about climate change um, and climate science and whether that's something that is a consideration for you? How do those policies actually impact you and also your perceptions of faith when it comes to who you're voting for, be it person or party in any given election? Um, yeah, so I would start by saying, um, I think Josh, you, you made the, the comment or the drew the conclusion that um, I meant to say that I would vote red based on party loyalty. Um, <clears throat> that's not uh, yeah. how I, that's not what I meant to say. Um, I do think it's a binary choice, therefore, generally speaking, I'm going to end up voting red, but I have no loyalty to the GOP. I think there are a lot of people, especially in the millennial demographic who lean right, who just are absolutely done with the GOP. Like cocaine yeah. Mitch can take his cocaine and go home um, as far as we're concerned. But speaking to how it intersects with my faith, um, I would say that I, uh, I hold individual liberty as my highest value. And I think that's the one of the highest values God holds for his creation. If you take, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you take the concept of the great controversy, the entire thing hinges on the fact that God is maintaining our ability to make a free choice at the expense of safety, at the expense of um, security, at the expense of almost anything you can imagine to keep us free to choose whether we want to follow him or not, even if that devolves the world into absolute chaos and darkness. Um, and I, that carries over into my politics, whether we like it or not, a free society is one I would take over a safe society. And I think that whatever party is, is going to maintain more freedoms, that's the one I'm going to go with. If you had, if I had lived maybe, you know, in the 50s or the 60s, when the progressives were, were pressing for more freedom, and um, the church or the right side was a little bit, uh, a little bit more oppressive, then I, you might have found me on that side back then. I can't know for sure. But in general, what I see in the 2020 American milieu of politics is the side that is actually trying to maintain some semblance of freedom of federalism in a global crisis um, of uh, reducing regulations, reducing all kinds of tax burdens and, and things like that to keep people more free. That's the right side of the aisle in 2020. The left side of the aisle are the ones who want equity. They want, um, they want equality of outcome. They want a lot of things that might sound good, but at the end of the day, the net outcome is removing people's freedoms. We see uh, freedom of speech being chipped away at or attacked. We see um, all kinds of different, if you want to go up, go look up Kamala Harris's video on <laughs> equity versus equality. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm absolutely in 100% not going to sign on to something that uh, states equality over freedom. Linda. Um, it's so interesting to hear Emily's take on the Republican Party um, and even bringing in ideas from the great controversy about our, our freedom when when I feel like it's the Democratic Party that is trying to do that uh, for the people. Uh, your body is your body. Let a woman decide what she's going to do with it. Democrats, Republicans are trying to take away 
or continue to hold that it is not their right uh, to choose. Um, and when it comes to Democrats and listening to science, when it comes to the health of the planet, you know, Dems are saying, let's all in, let's reduce carbon emissions, let's have these protections. Um, whereas the Republicans are saying, we can do whatever we want, let us continue burning coal at whatever rate we want to. That's whose freedom is that? Is it the person who's making the money or is it the people of the United States and their freedom for health and their freedom for choice? You know, when you, when you defund uh, the national parks and then blame it on the states for having fires, that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, help take care of it so that we don't have the fires, right? So like it's it's at their their opposing views of what Emily is saying. Like, yeah, I want my freedom, um, but it's only particular people who get to have their freedom under the the ideals and policies of the Republican Party. We want health care for all. Democrats are saying, let everyone have health care. But for some reason that that's an issue like the the republicans don't don't want that or something um it does it doesn't make sense so i feel like uh dems when you listen to science and like the things that they label as progressive it's for the people like how do we all live a health healthier life together how do we all contribute to it how do we all benefit from it versus it versus it being some that's what it feels like um, for me. And, and my, my background, like when it comes, I'm a, I'm a church pastor. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things, like, am I even supposed to be talking about this? Like, am I supposed to have a viewpoint on this v verbally, publicly? And I think it's the not answer from is, the pulpit. well, yeah, right. Um, and I think the answer is yes. Because I think we as Christians, we're called to be stewards of the planet, right? Like that's what God gave Adam and Eve as their first job to go and name and to take care of. I mean, it's part, it's part of what we're called to do. God made us for relationships. God built us and came and died for us and is coming back for us all because of relationships. And I feel like, I mean, this is some can say this is a stretch, but I mean, I, I think that's what we're called to do, to love on each other and to take care of each other and be stewards of the things that are around us. And I feel like the reason I'm a Democrat is because the policies of the Dems uh, are more in line with that, of taking care of the planet, of providing health for those that need it, all of us, for providing um, stability and security in your jobs by having unions versus defunding or wanting to remove unions, which is more of a Republican stance. You know, some of those things. Um, that's why that's why I vote um, Dem. I would draw one distinction, um, and I'm curious to see uh, what Linda thinks of this, this distinction. I would say in general, the sort of right side of the aisle, the right leading philosophy, um, wants the some of similar things in the sense that we want everyone to do well we want everyone to be free we want everyone to live the best that they can but on the right side of the aisle the pressure is put on the individual to make that happen on the left side of the aisle the pressure is put on the collective to make that happen and so when linda talks about um uh you know environmentalism and things that ostensibly would help the collective good um all of those things uh cannot if from a right-wing viewpoint those things cannot be achieved because you're never going to get everyone to sign on without force without um coercion and so when you take when you take the responsibility and put it on the individual and say yeah we want the society to succeed we want everyone to be in the best, best position possible but it's each of our individual responsibilities to make that happen versus okay now we all have to do x thing to make it good for everyone it's not going to happen unless the government comes in and starts strong arming people and i think that's one of the key differences between the way that 
right leaning and left leaning people look at it is where do you put the pressure um mm. yeah. i agree no em i agree i think though the the pressure is not for on individuals the pressure is in the form of leadership like hey let's as a people bring down carbon emission so it's not just hey you the individual right. Stop driving your 1984 Hyundai. It's hey, let's as a let's as a people have a goal and work on it. And so that's where the leadership part comes in. Like drive whatever right, but you you're want not to. Going just to... make sure you pass smog, right? That's the thing. You as an but, individual but... drive whatever you want, but pass smog so that we're not like hurting. Right, exactly. Hurting. And when you say pass smog, that's something the government is forcing you to do. And right, never... so that we all individually can help lower carbon emissions. So it's something that's done as a group. Here's our right. goal as a group. Now you as an individual do whatever you need to do. Exactly, which is what I set up at the at the start of I value freedom, individual freedom above group safety. And I think that's the difference here is right wingers tend to value individual freedom above collective safety and the opposite for the reverse. It's so that interesting because that's not the history of the Republican Party, right? Like there was actually <laughs> this huge shift. Like if you, the Republican Party back in the 1800s were, were pro like expansion of slavery. Like Lincoln was a Republican, right? Um, Republicans used to be against slavery, against um, like preserving, they were, for preserving of political power structures. No, 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 that was after, that's part of the switch. Before they were uh, supporting economic reform, they didn't want the expansion of slaves, things like that. And then in the early 1900s, it switched, where then they became the ones that seemed to stem those things. Like, let's preserve the power structures, whereas, which is where you get the name GOP from, grand old party. It's preserving the things that we now want to protect, but it was a certain group of individuals that were preserving what they held as important for their group, not for the collective group. Whereas Dems are the democratic, you know, like it's for the everyone. So yeah, I see what you're saying, Em, like uh, Republicans are more about individual freedom, whereas Democrats are collective freedom. Like let's together let's have some Except of these that collective that freedom is kind of an oxymoron although i will say um to your point about the great switch if anybody's interested look up carol swain on the topic of the the great switch but irrespective of whether that actually happened because there is a dis disagreement along party lines there as well um like i said too i'm for whoever in this moment is pre in my perception preserving individual freedom the most so whether there was a great switch or not is irrelevant to me because i'm going to support what i see as um the the standard bearers of individual freedom which i do not see at all um on the left side of the aisle in 2020. one of one of the things that i observe as an outsider is that you know the individual freedom I struggle to understand um, that as a value because it's not something that I've grown up with in my country, with my political system here. Um, we have things like universal health care um, where the government puts the structure in place to right. give people access to things. And I suppose em, the, the challenge um, for people like me who have grown up with that system is when I look at, you know, repealing the Affordable Care Act as a policy, say, for health care and those sorts of things, it seems almost like the Republican Party in upholding individual freedoms does it by oppressing people. Um, so how do, we, how do we balance upholding individual freedoms without the oppressive kind of tactics? Or, as an outsider, do I misread that? Uh, describe what you see as the oppressive byproduct of individual freedom. I'm not so, sure exactly what you mean. So, by that. like, when you're talking individual freedom, I'll, I'll use healthcare um, as the example. So, here in Australia, we have something called Medicare, slightly different to your version of Medicare. Um, but if I go to the hospital um, or I um, need an operation or I go and get a COVID test 
all of that is covered by the government, 100%. Um, just happens. Um, if I go to the doctor, there might be a small fee, say $70, but that doctor consultation fee is then rebated. I'll get about $30 of that back in my pocket. Um, so I have to pay up front, but I'll get some of it back. Um, so that for me is, you know, universal healthcare. Uh, I have the, the freedom to access healthcare. Whereas when I look at the Affordable Care Act, conversely to that, it's like, yes, you've got kind of some aspects of that happening, but when it comes to um, pre-existing conditions and those sorts of things and um, repealing the Affordable Health Care Act, what I see as far as a, a um, taking away of the individual freedom is we only want health care to be available to those who can afford it. Your minimum wage in the US is like $7.90 or something per hour, mm. um, whereas in Australia, our minimum wage is like $19.76 or something like that per hour. Mm. Um, we don't have a tipping system in Australia when we go out to a restaurant because we pay people a livable wage. So if you're going to repeal the Affordable Care Act that gives people access in some respects to free health care or affordable health care, why then won't you then raise the minimum wage so they can at least afford the health care that they're now not able to access. Right. That's not a, a, Sorry. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, this comes down to the fundamental difference between the small mind, a small government minded people and the, the converse. Small government minded people by default don't think healthcare is the government's job. We don't think wage control is the government's job. We don't think rent control is the government's job. The government has very few jobs. Maintain our God-given uh, human rights and maintain law and order. That's about Debatable. the extent of it. <laughs> so, so the very conversation around healthcare, if you're talking to a truly right-wing person, they're never going to um, they're never going to be on board with that because when you're saying we want everyone to have access to health care from a right wing perspective, what you're saying is we are going to hold everyone at gunpoint to fund health care for everybody else. And that's not that's against our values. So if you're wanting everyone to have health care, you. Uh, OK, and here's another piece of it. This is a commonly misunderstood. There's a big difference between capitalism and crony capitalism. Now, a lot of Republicans are not happy with our healthcare private, the private sector of our healthcare system. It's a huge, like, couple of different curse words that you could throw in right there. Um, and nobody's happy, happy with it. That being said, the solution is not to nationalize healthcare because that's fundamentally against our principle of healthcare is not the government's job. Um, so if you were to talk about, if you were to talk about giving individuals freedom at the expense of other people, um, you can make the reverse argument that forcing all of us to collectively fund healthcare for everyone else is taking away our freedom to be in a free market capitalist um, economy. Follow up follow-up comment to that and i this may this may come out of a place of ignorance but i do find it that that stance quite interesting given that you as u.s citizens did collectively fund donald trump when he got COVID 19 when he went to walter reed he didn't pay a cent that was all taxpayer money so why is it okay for ted cruz um, Donald Trump and any other GOP party member, government official to have state sponsored social Medicare uh, health treatment, but it, it's not okay for everybody else. Like, I, I don't know. I just find that really disconcerting that distinction. If it's, if it's, if it's for the top health, uh, government officials, we're going to fund it through taxpayer money, but nobody else can do that because that's that's crazy. 
tell me which Republicans you know that oh, like that idea. I don't think very many Republicans <laughs> like the idea of the collect the uh, the elite or the ruling class having access to anything anybody else does. And I think most of us would have been fine if Trump had had to pay out of pocket for his um, his. Uh, his own care. The basic principle at, still is at play that, in general, we don't think that healthcare is government's job. And when you start putting things like um, all of our, the different agencies we have, like the EPA and all of these regulatory agencies, where suddenly the government is coming and saying X, Y, Z for such and such aspect of your life, we're like, no, we don't want any of that. Just like go away, leave us alone, and. Um, let people make the decisions that they need to make, even if it's to their detriment. So I think that's why, oh, sorry. I was gonna say, I think that's why uh, the Dems just think collectively. Uh, national health is individual health. You know, uh, it's it's when, ev when everyone's healthy, we are healthier. Um, and that comes to- But I didn't consent to pay for it. But did you consent to have the largest military budget in the world that is larger than the next seven countries combined? combined? Well, the military is actually part of government's job. Although I would say that in general, we're not, uh, right wingers are not huge fans of spending, including the military, though, that, like I said, military is the government. So, oh, sorry, Linda, go ahead. I cut you off. <laughs> no, no. I, we're good. So let's can I just, um, I don't want this to, to devolve potentially in a let's, let's attack the Reds type of thing. And I, I'm aware that we're kind of potentially teetering on that edge. Um, I do want to ask a question. You said there were two roles of government. Can you just re rehash those for me? Uh, one of them is protecting our human civil liberties, uh, which the Constitution asserts that they're given by God and not the government. So, uh, but your constitution the... has been amended 27 times. <laughs> yeah, but that that does not um, negate the fact that our rights are given by God and not the government. Yep. That's the underlying philosophy there. Um, law and order, which includes law enforcement and the mil military, and national, so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, Homeland Security, I guess, national, yep. the military, pretty much. Um, what are some of the other things that we think so are actually the, the government's response? They're really the only two that you labelled before. You just used a different word there when you said it the second time. So the, the second time you said your God-given human liberties, but the mm -hmm. first time you said your God-given human rights. Um, and the reason I wanted to make that distinction is because according to the UN Charter of Human Rights, Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. How does that fit in the Republican Party's policies? Because this, how is that a right? How is that a right? Well, that's, that is the universal charter of human rights. Why that's is the, the US, why is the US Constitution the only document we go to when it comes to rights? Because we are the United States of America and our government is based on our constitution. I mean, who said the UN is suddenly the authority on what's a right? Uh, but the UN uh, are the ones who charge you for war crimes with the international justice courts. Yeah, but, but this is the difference between government given rights and God given rights. The, the constitution recognizes what we consider God given rights, which is the right to live your life, the right okay. not to be uh, have things imposed on you. What's, what the UN is saying is a, some kind of manifesto of things that the governments or the various okay. countries of the world say but are it's not rights. The, is not the US a government run country? So. If the UN is giving governments advice and the US is saying, well, we have God given rights, not government rights, then why do you have a government at all? Uh, to protect the very bare minimum. I mean, the whole point of, of protecting the God given rights is to keep people from imposing on your ability to live your life, from killing you, from, in, from injuring you. Those are the things that at the founders, I mean, we don't, we don't want an anarchy. We don't want just yep. co total, you know, s society with no government. The point of small government is the government only does what it absolutely has to do to protect people from just, you know, 
tribalistically whacking each other over yeah. whatever. Um, but we're not going to suddenly, well, we say we're not going to suddenly just start adding these different rights. Like a lot of right wingers would argue Roe versus Wade is not a right, um, especially from the federal Supreme Court level. That shouldn't be, that at the very least, it should be something that each state is deciding um, for themselves. So when, when we say, when we're talking about God-given rights, we're talking about the right for me not to have my life uh, threatened or uh, endangered by somebody else. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think so, it, um, it's so interesting real quick, like those different viewpoints then, right? Because Dems not necessarily like God said, right? God said doesn't dictate or doesn't rule uh, what it's, there's a civil law and then there's a, a moral law, right? Um, but even then, if if you looked at it, Democrats with God-given rights, God, God-given right is life, life more abundant um, for all, not for some. Uh, so that's just one of those interesting things, listening to, to what you're saying, Em. I think, I mean, yes, we, I think it's important for everyone to have a voice in saying what is important to you or not, but I think the role of government is for the people. And if there are things that are in place that are going to affect the majority of people, like pollution is going to kill people, right? Um, COVID is hurting people. There are some of these things that, that are part of the government's job. Um, this is why there's been such a huge issue with, uh, from the Democratic side or, or a lot of just a lot of sides on on how the Republicans have taken care of COVID. Is it the individual's right to put on their mask or do we collectively as a nation put on a mask to make sure that we are protecting those that are around us? You know, like it's come down to that when it's on party lines too. Dems are wearing masks, Republicans aren't wearing masks, you know, like that type of thing. Well, it's just, not entirely. Let's, no, let's no, no. be honest. Yeah, yeah. But no, 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 for sure. But when you're looking at who's who's supporting what, it's a clear, it's a clear It is thing. political, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So the, the question, I suppose, and, and this has been an eye-opening experience for me, and you've actually probably made it clearer than I've ever had before, is that we often look at this from outsiders as being, here are the policies, here are the arguments. But you're saying the policies are not so much of an issue as much as they are, but the main issue is not about this policy, that policy, and that policy. It's around what is the government's primary responsibility and your view on what the government's primary responsibility, and perhaps those who vote red, their view on the primary responsibility of government is like just drastically different to what the blue view of government's responsibility is. Um, I've never had it put that way. So I want to thank you for for putting it that way because I think oftentimes we just think, oh, it's tension, it's argument about this, it's argument about that. But when you take it back to the the very foundation, it's around, well, what do you hold as the government's responsibility? Perhaps, Linda, I want to give you a chance to respond to that around what your view as one who votes blue, um, what is your view on government's responsibility more broadly, obviously, we've had you know the rights or, or um, the God-given rights or liberties, as M said, and also the safety of the nation. If I can put it as basic as that, you probably would agree with those, but perhaps add or you know view it, voice it slightly differently. Yeah, just I mean, just a little. Uh, again, I think it is care for the whole. Uh, that's where I come back to the word stewardship. Um, I'm responsible not just for me, but my neighbor. Um, if my neighbor makes more than me or makes less than me, they're still my neighbor. Uh, so if that means I'm spending some of my day helping to cut their grass or to take them groceries, that's part of my responsibility. Yes, as an individual, but that's also um guided by the thought of thinking of us as a collective whole um and i think democrats just think more of that like uh what do we do for 
our collective whole. That's not these individual like, well, I should own my own gun. Like I get people wanting to have their own things, but let's also be mindful that we're not, we're not alone. Uh, and the care of others. And I think biblically for me, that it's just a huge part. Like, um, God's greatest commandment was for us to love one another. It wasn't just our take care of yourself and I'll see you at the finish line. Right. Like, we're given a task to do. Um, and we were told by God to love one another, not just take care of self. Uh, and I'm not just, I'm not, and I'm not trying to say that Republicans are selfish or, or that they're wholly individualistic, but it's guiding a lot of their principles and, and in turn affects their practices. Um, I think like Emily is saying, it's really important to make sure that I'm, that we as individuals are protected. Sure, Democrats, we think that as well. Uh, what, what differs us is there's more to the role of government than just those, those two issues, because there are more issues out there that are affecting us as individuals and as a collective society. Uh, so like you pointed out, Josh, we've, we've had so many amendments, why wouldn't we add these others to it as well? Um, why is healthcare for all not important for all of us? Like for me as a Democrat, as a Christian Democrat, it totally makes sense. Like, let's just make sure everyone's healthy. Let's get homeless off the streets. It's gonna cost us as individuals less because taxpayers are then having to pay less for their medical health care when they're not taken care of, right? Um, there's so many factors that go into it other than just what is it doing for me um, that you have to take into that you have to take into account uh, and and I think it follows more of the spirit of what Jesus was trying to teach us versus maybe the letter of what we sometimes read in the Bible that that the some parties can can take I think out of context. Em, I feel you've got a, a response brewing there, so we'll give you opportunity. I have several points here. Uh, first, starting with the, just circling back to the comments about God-given rights and that not being a very, a thus saith the Lord is not really strong with a lot of people in secular Western postmodern culture. Um, I would also argue that there are very, a lot um, and many people who are on the secular right who believe in the same concept of natural rights, which whether you believe in God or not still apply. Um, so, I mean, because we uh, were technically a, a Christian founding and we're teetering on the edge of being a Christian nation, um, that's kind of built into the language God-given rights, but you could take natural law as, as yep. that's just as kind of a side point. To Linda's point about um, we're not just individuals, but we are also a collective. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. I am responsible for the people around me. I am responsible for taking care of um, people who uh, are in my sphere of influence who are not as well off as me. Um, the difference in our philosophies, however, is that right-wingers think that that is the responsibility of uh, private motivation. Mm. So if you look at it, you'll find the right gives a lot of charity. There's a lot of private um, uh, sort of stewardship happening. And if we can transfer all of the things that the left would like to do onto the responsibility of people to do it because they're doing it of their own volition rather than the government coming in and saying you must do X, Y, and Z, you must fund national health care, you must do all of these things. I think that's the difference between uh, those two philosophies because at the end of the day, if you are, if you're forcing someone to follow the Ten Commandments, it's but not a they don't thing. want to, are they adhering to the Ten Commandments? So you're essentially saying, Em, it's, it's around the individual kind of cultural decision you're not saying we're against the the collective as far as those on the right yeah but it's got to be the individual's choice rather than forced on the individual 
Correct. And I would, I would also say, I do acknowledge there is a faction on the right side of the aisle that is hyper individualistic to the point of being like, you know, screw you. <laughs> uh, like I do what I want. And I, I also don't agree with that because, because of our Christian sort of background of um, we are responsible to care for each other. That being said, if you look at the disciples and the early, the apostles and stuff, they, they kind of lived a little bit collectively in the sharing of their resources and things like that. But it wasn't the government coming and telling them, you have to do this. It was that they were all invested in that community and that was something that they were doing to be a part of that community. And I think that you'll see that sort of attitude um, with a lot of Christians on the right side of the political aisle. Yeah, and this is the thing I think sometimes we think everyone who leans right is the extreme right and everyone who leans left is the extreme left. But there's so many places in between. Um, And I think that, you know, you can be right and you can be left or you can just be be slightly right or slightly left, but you're still lumped in with the everyone. Um, And I think that's that's always part of the risk when we we have these discussions. So thanks, Mm. guys, for sharing a bit around your rights and lefts. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, what, if I could just one tiny little thing at the end, I, it, it has kind of, it's always, I've always understood this, but it does, I think it's a lot more clear to me now that as, as followers of Jesus, there is no political party that is going to um, represent our ideology as um, new creation, citizens of the kingdom, and that ultimately, no matter which way we lean politically in terms of our own personal sensibilities or our own responsibility to democracy or whatever, that I, it, it does seem to me that at the end of the day, our ultimate political ideology has to be Jesus is Lord and that everything else is just kind of window dressing in a way of what is what fits with our own personal um set of morality and knowing that this is a complicated world. We know, um, we obviously know, if you haven't figured out by now, where the two of you um, are hoping this election is going to go. Um, so I'm not going to say who do you hope is going to win, but irrespective of who you hope is going to win, uh, I would love if you could just share um, what are you hoping for um in your ideal world, I know that 2020 has kind of been a, a, it's been, it's been 2020. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of us are going into this election season kind of uh, a little bit uh, jaded and a little bit negative about how this whole thing is going to, is going to turn out. We're expecting that bad things are going to happen. But if, if, if the good stuff happens, uh, if if the best case scenario happens, what are you hoping for, um, irrespective of who uh, ends up winning on uh, on the day? Probably on the two or three weeks. After well, the day. yeah, right. that's, that's <laughs> the true. end of the year, January. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we might figure out eventually. <laughs> so yeah. Um, I'll start. I would say. I mean, not to use the hyperbolic and overused term, the most important election of this. Yeah, I, I do think it is an important election mm. um, in that I do think we are sort of at a heightened, heightened level of uh, divide in this country. So in that sense, I do think it's an important election. And I do think, um, I do think that in the long run, we will be better off if Donald Trump is reelected. That being said, um, I think there's going to be a large swath of people, no matter who wins, that's going to be very surprised because there's a large group of people that's sure Trump is going to win. And there's a large group of people that's sure Biden is going to win. So that being said, there is a, a sense of anxiety. There is a sense of uncertainty. And I would just say um, for myself, uh, I just hope that we We as Americans, we as Republicans or Democrats, we as Christians, we as Seventh-day Adventists specifically can maintain the sense of hope that we um, look beyond what's happening here in this world. I I was listening to 
Um, I listen to a lot of political podcasts, just FYI. I was listening to one. If anybody's looking for sort of like kind of right-wing NPR, check out The American Mind, um, their Claremont Institute podcast. Anyway, they were describing it as we're all in this barrel going over, we're about to go over the waterfall. Um, and if you can achieve a sense of peace and a sense of calm, knowing that we're going over the waterfall <laughs> and there's nothing you can do to stop it, but we do have a sense of something larger. And I think as Christians, we are in a, a position to be able to take hold of that and to say, you know, I'm not going to let my life be thrown into total chaos and fear, regardless of what happens. And I'm going to cling to the things that are important to me and try to live in the most um, upright way that I can going forward, no matter what happens, that's what I would say. Uh, for me, you know, it's a, I was looking at some Pew and Barna studies before, before coming on. And it's interesting to note that in 2016, only 64% of those who voted, uh, listed themselves as Christian, uh, 64% of all, all who voted and when it comes to Republican and Democrats for the Adventist church, uh, we're not that strong in numbers. It's 45% who identify as Democrat, 35% as Republican. Uh, and I look at that and I just, I, I hope at the end of this specific election and elections to come that we realize that our political party is our vehicle for how we live our life. Um, just as I, as a Christian, Adventism is the vehicle that makes the most sense in helping me understand my relationship with God and how I'm going to participate in that relationship, how I'm going to view others and how I'm going to treat others. Adventism helps me identify that. My role and my political affiliation as a Democrat is my vehicle, like Adventism is. Um, it helps me understand better uh, what my role is as a nation, uh, what my role is as an individual for the nation and for and for those in my community. So I, I hope that left or right, blue or red, whatever independent green, because we've got all we've got those as well. Uh, I hope that that people don't forget what our for those that are Christian that are listening and for those that are Adventist Christians that are listening, that we don't forget that this is our vehicle. This is an opportunity for us to better define and then defend or, or act out our Christianity. Um, Jesus is still coming. Uh, be great if it was tomorrow. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, let's not let these things um, be our only definers. It's supposed to be one of our identifiers in helping us be Christians, right? For those who are Christians. Uh, so I hope that is something because we just feel, we feel that tension in our churches, right? We feel our, that tension in our homes. Uh, and it shouldn't be. We, yes, we should disagree, but it doesn't mean the end of relationships. It should just be, this is, this is how I'm going to move forward in my Christian faith. And I still love you, even though you are red dad. Uh, like this is, we're still, we're still family. Let's do this together. And, and let's continue running in the race, right? So that's what I'm hoping. Awesome. Uh, Josh, any last words from you? Yeah, I just, your... I just want to pick up on what you've just shared, Linda, around, you know, I still love you, Dad, even though you vote red. The, as much as I appreciate that, I think the challenge there is that you are in relationship with your dad. You're not necessarily in relationship with other with people else. voting mm -hmm. red. And so whilst that's a great sentiment, whether that's an actuality, I think is a, a challenging thing for us. Um, but I really do also appreciate the fact that, you know, we've been able to have this conversation around, you know, a, a right leaning, a left leaning within the, the US political system. It's been, in my opinion, um, and, you know, I'm sure people who may disagree comment in the podcast, leave a review, whatever that is, you may disagree, but I, I think it's largely been respectful 
Um, and I think that that's the one thing that I, I would love to see, especially millennials who are our, you know, our target listenership, is that you can differ on major issues, be them political issues, be them issues around, say, same-sex marriage, abortion, gun control, um, COVID responses. You can disagree, but you can still be respectful. Um, and that's the thing that I think, you know, I really want people to get out of this. And I want to thank both of you, uh, Linda and M, for, for having this conversation in a respectful manner, even though, you know, we've had a couple of visceral kind of reactions to things and those sorts of things have occurred. That's okay. We can still walk away saying, yeah, had a great discussion. Disagree with you fundamentally, but I'm not going to hold it against you. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, agreed. Emily's still going to be someone in my life that I love. We can definitely disagree. And I think, Josh, it's important that you noted out the familial tie that I have with my dad. But as a Christian, I the stranger is supposed to be someone who is part of my family as well, yeah. right? So I, I think that's important to, mm. to note as well. Everyone, everyone mm. deserves to be treated because Jesus died for all of us, mm. regardless mm. of color. Yeah, so true. So true. All right. I think that's a, that's a great note to uh to, to land the plane with uh, i want to thank once again em and linda as well as josh our resident political junkie for um participating in this in this discussion uh, i hope that you're all doing really really well whether you're listening to this on election day or in the weeks to come um we'll keep this brief like subscribe all that good stuff and uh We'll see you in the next one. Josh you, Josh has one pithy last thing that he wants to share. Yeah, I'm like, Jesse, you're going to be able to listen to this on election day when we're not planning to release it until after election day. Well, look, <laughs> it's it's all about... it's just it's, <laughs> Election 2024. Oh, yeah, 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 he yeah. Didn't, he didn't put it in that much of a time frame. You're right there, Linda. If you're it's... listening to this on election day, it was leaked. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's great. That's great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. That is Josh, Jesse, M, and Linda out. <laughs>